You'll have your Bibles open to the book of 1 Kings chapter 21. Read verses 1 through 19. 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it's near next to my house. And for it I will give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I'll give you its worth in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed turned away his face and would eat no food. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? He said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it pleases you, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I'll not give you my vineyard. Then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel? Arise! Eat food and let your heart be cheerful. I'll give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city of, with Naboth. She wrote in the, in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and seek Naboth with high honor among the people and seek two men, scoundrels or, or worthless men, some, one translation says. Before him to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him, that he may die. So the men of his city, the elders, the nobles who were inhabitants of the city, did as Jezebel had sent them, had sent to him, to them, as it was written in the letters which she had sent to them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth with high honor among the people. And two men, scoundrels, came in and sat before him. And the scoundrels witnessed against him, against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. Then they took him outside the city and stoned him with stones so that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. And it came to pass, when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. So it was when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab got up and went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is, in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, in the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. Lord Jesus, once again we ask for your help as we go through this message. Speak to our hearts and challenge us tonight, we pray in your precious name. Amen. Just by way of background, Israel, as you know, after the reign of Solomon was divided into the northern and southern kingdoms. Rehoboam, Solomon's son, reigned in the south, and, and uh, in Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned over everything north of Jerusalem. And there was a succession of kings after, after Jeroboam, and the eighth king of Israel uh, was Ahab. 
from 874 to 853 BC. So we're talking a long time ago. Uh, Ahab followed in the footsteps of his father Omri, who, by the way, is recognized in ancient uh, Assyrian documents and whose name is inscribed on uh, the famous Mesha Stila or the Mesha inscription. Uh, he made his capital in Samaria and made an alliance with the king of Sidon or Sidon by having his son marry the pagan princess of Sidon. Her name was Jezebel. And uh, Sidon was a coastal city in Palestine of Phoenician origins. But it was Omri uh, who further encouraged the worship of pagan deities. In, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 25, Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all who were before him, that is, until Ahab took the throne. The author at the outset of the Ahab story, the Ahab account here, paints us the picture. Uh, verse 33 of chapter 16 states, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. And yet even uh, uh, to a king like Ahab, God was faithful. And uh, he was faithful to shed light on his path, just as he is faithful to shed light on every path of every human being. He was not left without a witness. And the prophet Elijah was that witness. Um, you'll remember Elijah and Ahab had their encounters. It was Elijah in 1 Kings 18 who told Ahab it wouldn't rain for three years. Actually, a little, little bit more than three years because of his wickedness and, and nature cooperated. And in that sense, nature also became a witness against Ahab's wickedness. Ahab was doing everything he could to, to please his queen. And uh, when she talked, he hopped. <laughs> you know? uh, she was on the warpath against the prophets of God. And chapter 18 of 1 Kings tells us she massacred uh, any she could find. And so she truly was an evil queen. Now Elijah the prophet was, like I said, he was, he was the witness to Ahab. He was a thorn in Ahab's side. In fact, Ahab spoke of Elijah as the troubler of Israel. Didn't like him at all. And uh, until finally we have that famous encounter, you'll, you'll recall, between Ahab and Elijah uh, on Mount Carmel, you got 450 prophets of Baal against one prophet of God. I mean, that was a showdown. That's better than Wyatt Earp at OK Corral. I mean, this was, this was something else. And that, that day, like never before, God answered with fire. A fabulous story. Just incredible. And then Israel that day recognized that Yahweh was God. And uh, Israel uh, then... You know, they, they, they looked at Elijah, I think, a little through different lens that day. And Elijah had the prophets of Baal seized, you'll remember, and had them executed. And it was a day of high drama, high drama. And you recall then how after three long years it began to rain. Elijah told his servant to go up on a mountain and see what he could see. And he went over and he saw the Mediterranean. He said, I see a, a cloud the size of a man's hand coming up. And he said, it's going to rain. And you remember, remember the story how he, he girded up his, his, uh, his robe, if you were. He, he outran the chariots back to town. Ahab's chariots. Another witness to, to God's involvement in Ahab's life. But the tragedy, tragedy of it all was that even though God's light exposed Ahab for who he was, a wicked man, Ahab remained unchanged. He went home pouting and told Jezebel about what had happened, and she was infuriated by it all and became more determined than ever to take Elijah's life. And so when we come to our text, the author has acquainted us very well with the character of Ahab and the character of Jezebel. These are two wicked people in power. 
And they're filled with pride, they're filled with arrogance, and filled with me, self-interest. There was a description of two hearts, which the Apostle Paul in the New Testament would describe as carnal. It was these two. And so tonight, I'd like for us to, to take a look at what a carnal heart looks like from this story. Let's look at it and notice the characteristics of a carnal heart. First of all, we see here that Ahab desires a vineyard. The King Ahab wants a vineyard. He, the text tells us that a fellow by the name of, Na, name of Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard right next to the king's palace, right next to his house. And uh, it must have been a very nice vineyard because, after all, this was prime real estate. It was like putting, it was like having a garden right next to the White House. And so uh, uh, it would have, you know, uh, it, it was no, not just an ordinary vineyard. It was in the nice part of town. And uh, Ahab noticed it, and he liked it, and he wanted it. And now notice what happens. He desires it for his own. Now there's nothing wrong with desiring to have a vineyard by your house, to have a garden by your house. That's perfectly normal. As a matter of fact, Ahab was willing to give him, as our text said, a nicer vineyard in exchange. He probably had one out on the outside of town somewhere. And if he didn't want that, he said, I'll, I'll give you money. I'll pay for it. But uh, uh, so far, so good, right? So far, so good. It was a legitimate desire, and his request is all above board. But you see, as we said the other night, the test of a man's character is not displayed when things are going well. <laughs> because at times it's difficult to tell what a person is made of when life is on easy street and friends are, are uh, at every turn. That's not where you see the test of a man's character. The inner fiber of a person is not seen so much when everything is going in your direction. And all your dreams are being fulfilled and, and your life is filled with one success story after another. That's not where character is tested. I dare say that character is revealed the most when your wishes, when your dreams, your plans are delayed or destroyed altogether because of hardships or because of uh, difficulties or circumstances beyond your control. You look at a, an individual who, who has gone through difficulties not of his own making, whether it's uh, a financial difficulty or uh, a relationship that has been broken or, or there, he's experiencing or she is experiencing some kind of loss or grief and yet they maintain a sweet spirit and resolve that come what may, they're going to reflect the spirit of Christ. You look at an individual like that and you'll see an individual who has a deeper work of God in her heart. Now let's look at Ahab after he hears Naboth's response. Naboth says, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. You know, the first thing I thought of was, I don't think he likes him very much. You know, this king, I, we don't know too much about Naboth. But uh, uh, apparently he, he just simply didn't want to give over his garden to him for whatever reason. And we find out here, he says, it's my father's inheritance. That's, that was the reason he gave but I have a feeling that he probably didn't like it either. <laughs> At any rate, now notice how, notice how uh, the carnal heart displays itself. Verse 4. So Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased. Now the Hebrew there, the word is sar. Sullen, it means resentful. He went into his house resentful. But verse 4 is not finished. Look at, look at the display he puts on. He goes to his room, he lays down on his bed, and like a pouting child, he turns his face to the wall, 
wouldn't eat any food. Essentially, the king is having a pity party. That's what's happening. Suddenly, Ahab is showing his true colors. His legitimate desire has turned into envy. Envy has turned into greed. And greed has not been satisfied. And so resentment has set in. <laughs> and so if I were to exegete this passage, I would have to say that the text is telling us that the carnal heart, the heart of sin, is noted by how easily it becomes offended and by how long it holds a grudge. Mm -hmm. Did you hear me on that? Yeah. The carnal heart is noted by how easily it becomes offended and how long it holds a grudge. If you study this passage, you'll find that Ahab's grudge was held long enough to devise a plot of murder. <laughs> Can you believe it? Devise a plot of murder long enough to send out letters to nobles and, and men of high stature in the city. Long enough to declare a fast. Long enough to murder an innocent man. There's Ahab, resentful, lying on his bed, not eating, showing a fit of carnality. And who comes to comfort him? None other than the pagan princess of Sidon, Queen Jezebel herself. Carnality loves carnality. <laughs> they kind of hang around with each other. Mm -hmm. And so Queen Jezebel comes into the room. Now you think Ahab's actions are bad. You ain't seen nothing yet. Watch how Jezebel gets hold of this one. Jezebel is introduced in this, in this account in verse 5. You see, the author of this story is not satisfied by showing how sin acts and reacts in just one individual. He's driving the point home here. And so he introduces Jezebel. Her name means, by the way, Baal exalts. That's what her name means. So we know she's a pagan. She's not even a follower of Yahweh. Long ways away from and so, like the serpent of old in chapter 3 of Genesis, who posed that question to Eve, likewise, this woman presents to her husband a question. Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? What gives, Ahab? Now, let me remind you, this is three chapters after the confrontation between her prophets and the prophet Elijah. She's not a happy woman at all. <laughs> and we all know how that ended. This, this is a woman that has been stung. And uh, we've seen her character in chapter 18, verse 4. Not only does she come from a pagan family, but she's a killer of God's prophets. She's not a woman to be trusted. She's a, she's a snake in the grass. Man, I've seen those snakes lately. Lost two yearlings just the other day by two rattlesnake bites. And that's what this woman reminds me of. About stepped on it, too, about a yard and a half away. Man, that thing started rattling. Boy, if that doesn't put an adrenaline in you, I don't know what will. You look at that critter and you say, that thing can put me into the next world. And that's what this woman was like. <laughs> so watch out when a carnal person begins to ask you questions. Pastor, watch out when a carnal lay person begins to ask you a ton of questions. This woman was asking questions because what happens is you say what you say to that person does not stay with that person. Huh?
You may as well be talking into a loudspeaker. And damage is done in God's house for lack of discernment of what is said and to whom it is said. But now notice how the author paints Jezebel's character for the reader. Ahab, like a spoiled puppy, there he is. He whines and whimpers his problem to his wife. Look at verse 6 again with me. I read it kind of in a monotone, but uh, I kind of think it sounded more like this. She came to him, Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? What's the matter with you? And he said to her, Because I, I spoke to Naboth, the, the Jezreelite, said to him, I said, give me your vineyard for money, or else if it pleases you, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I'll not give you my vineyard. <laughs> then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, you wimp. No, don't say that. <laughs> you exercise authority over Israel, cry it out loud, arise, she says. Eat some food and let your heart be cheerful. I'll give you, I'll give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Boy, she began to write letters plagiarizing his name. <laughs> Writing in his name. And so now the author is showing us a little bit more of the character of a carnal heart. And as I look at Jezebel and her response, I have to say this, that first of all, the carnal heart refuses to take the road of humility. Do you see that? On the contrary, the carnal heart, the fleshly heart, the sinful heart, elevates status. It elevates power and prestige. And those are carnality's best friends. They go hand in hand. But there's something more we can glean from Jezebel's response. Not only does she try and make her husband take the bait concerning, concerning his position as king, but she also elevates herself. I give you the vineyard. And this, of course, ties in with what we just said. But let me re reword it this way. The mark of a carnal heart is seen by its self center. It's a heart that revolves around itself. Sometimes it's obvious, and you can see it a mile away, and it stinks to high heaven. And sometimes it's real subtle. Sometimes it takes discernment. But the mark is still there. It's the same dragon in each case. And since it's a heart that revolves around itself, it can display itself in self-pity as it did with Ahab. Or it plays with another bedfellow called arrogance. And in verse 7b, you can hear the arrogance in Jezebel's voice. I'll give you the vineyard. But the author's not finished describing the heart of this wicked queen. He goes into detail as to what she's scheming. She begins to write letters, as we said, in Ahab's name to the elders and the nobles. Verse 9, she proclaims a fast. Man, that sounds really religious, doesn't it? <laughs> and it was just a big trick. Seat Naboth with high honor. She's going to really make him look bad, look like a fool. And put two worthless men to bear witness against Naboth. Seat him right there with him. Then take Naboth out and stone him. Wow. You see what the carnal heart is capable of? It is capable of being underhanded. It's capable of being deceitful. And it's capable of having the spirit of murder. You know what I think? I think Jesus is just as much or more concerned about the disposition of my heart 
then he is the sin that one commits. You remember back in Mark chapter 3? I've been enjoying Dr. S Dr. Smith's teachings on, on Mark. And correct me on this if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. Smith, David, but Jesus enters the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And there was a man there with a withered hand. And Mark describes it really well. The Pharisees are standing along the, the wall to see what Jesus would do. So that they might accuse him. You see. Then Jesus asked a very pertinent question. He looked at him. It was the Sabbath. He looked at the Pharisees along the wall and and uh, he says, is it lawful? Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? You know what Mark says at this point? They kept silent. They didn't say a thing. And then... The Bible says that Jesus looked around at them with anger. I like that. <laughs> it was righteous anger. Being grieved, the Lord was grieved by the hardness of their hearts. <laughs> they hadn't done anything. They were just standing there. Why is he so concerned about it? They're not lashing out at him. They're not speaking back. He was concerned because the disposition of the heart determines the actions of a person. And he knew what they were thinking. You see, the Pharisees hadn't murdered anybody yet. Maybe they had somebody before, you know, this came along. But it was in their heart. Because look what happens. Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched out his withered hand. And the text tells us that his hand was restored as the other. Right there in front. Then it says, the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might destroy him. It was the heart that determined the actions. I'm convinced, friends, that what we need is a work that goes deeper than the forgiveness of our sins. Mm -hmm. You've heard that preached in your churches. This, this denomination has has preached it, I believe, faithfully, maybe not all across the country, but in this area of our country, I think our preachers have been pretty good at it. And I'm convinced that we need a work that goes deeper than the forgiveness of sins. We must have our disposition changed. We have far too many Christians who are constantly in the asking forgiveness mode, but have never dealt with the disposition of the heart. You get down to that and you begin to deal with the very core of self-centeredness. And yet that's why Christ died, did He not? To send His Spirit so that He might come and deal with the disposition of my heart. And so Jezebel's wicked plan is carried out. Naboth is murdered. And then she tells Ahab to take the vineyard, and he does, and everything seemed to be just peaches and cream. <laughs> everything is fine except for one thing. It didn't escape the eyes of the Lord. It never does. He saw it all. Have you ever noticed that sin may be uh, carried out in secret? But there's always one who sees it. And it seems like sooner or later, even the secret sins become public. 
You ever notice that? God is faithful to every heart, including murderers. And so he sends Elijah, his prophet, down to Samaria where Ahab was, was staying and he confronted him. You know, God doesn't like to confront people. But so many times he has to, doesn't he? It's really a sad commentary on human beings. He doesn't enjoy confrontation. But he tells Elijah, he says, go over there and tell him, thus says the Lord. When you hear that in the Old Testament, you've got to perk your ears up. Because that's the final say, right there. Have you murdered and also taken possession? In place where dogs lick the blood of Naaman, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. And Elijah didn't spare words, brother. He, he went over to that fellow and he told him exactly what God had said. A terrible prophecy is proclaimed against him and against Jezebel. It's actually a curse of calamity upon his house. Look at verses 21 to 24. It says this, Behold, I will bring calamity on you, and I will take away your posterity, and will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city, and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. Didn't spare any words. But the amazing part of this story is in verses 27 to 29. Ahab hears this from Elijah's lips. So it was when Ahab heard those words that he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, check it out. <laughs> That's my modern translation. See how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring calamity on his house. Ahab heard Elijah's words and he tears his clothes, puts sackcloth on his body, fast and lays in sackcloth, went in the morning, and now we, you know, we, don't have, we, don't, 